before you and ask you please to superintend over our class this morning. It's on parenting this morning and the preaching of the word. The ministry of the word, Lord, is so critical to our growing up as Christians and beholding the magnificent glory of the Lord Jesus Christ from the pages of Scripture. And we thank you that you have, from eternity past, planned and purposed to set him on display so that we can know you. And so we just thank you for this magnificent book of Daniel where that's what it's all about. It's all about you and what you're planning and purposing. And we also get to see how Daniel loved you and interacted with you in the midst of very difficult circumstances. May we learn, may we truly learn from him. And uh, most of all, may we behold you and your beauty and glory. Because Daniel's God, dear Lord God, is you're our God. And so we want to live the way he lived, love the way he loved you and served you. And so we just give this time to you. Bless it now for the glory of your great name. Uh, for Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Okay. Um, in, this, uh, in this part of Daniel, uh, we're in chapter 2, picking up at 19, but we're, we're really going to see Daniel's heart. I mean, we've seen it. But when he prays, we, we really begin to see the relationship he has with God. Uh, it's so critical. When we get to chapter 9, another wonderful chapter on uh, his prayers to God, we will see the same thing. Uh, but we see his heart and his love for his God uh, as he gives thanks and praise to God, the God of his fathers. We're going to talk about that for revealing to him, revealing to him and his friends the mystery of the king's dream, okay? Um, he will humbly declare the king's dream to him, giving all credit for his ability to do so uh, to God, the God of heaven, the only true God. Um, you know, this kind of humility, this kind of humility and perspective is the exact opposite of the pride, the arrogance, the self-centeredness that characterizes the pagan empire in which he is the true God's representative. Um, the contrast, Daniel is a book of contrast. That's where the power is is manifested to us as we see the contrast between Daniel, who's a righteous man living in the midst of a pagan society, the contrast between his character and that of those around him, it, it, it's magnificent. And we need to learn and we need to see that his heart is our heart if you're saved. But, but even greater than that is the contrast between the true God, the, the true God of Daniel, and the gods of this pagan culture. And not only are we going to see the difference in terms of his person, his character, but also we're going to see that he's the only one who can accomplish his purposes as the true God, the sovereign God. It, 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 there's just, we're going to see that today, this contrast between God and... In fact, it's why he sets up everything the way he does, is to set himself on display. And uh, it's a big picture book. We're going, to, we're going to keep seeing that as we look at history unfold, as we press through uh, the book of Daniel. So... This contrast between Daniel's character and the character of those around him and the contrast between Daniel's God and the gods of the pagan empire in which he lives and serves, it'll continue throughout the book to the very end of Daniel. So let's dive in there and enjoy these texts today. 
chapter 2, 19 through 23, I just titled it Revelation, Praise, and Thanksgiving. And uh, the first part of uh, verse 19, God reveals the mystery to Daniel and his friends. 2.19a, then the mystery. Remember, they, they were praying, then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Um, we talked a little bit, we're going to talk a little bit more right now, but in response then to Daniel and his friends' time in prayer, remember the king gave them time to go do, to beseech God, uh, in, in, in 2, 17 and 18, remember, he gathered his friends together. This was critical, and they have like-mindedness, and so they gather together to, uh, to request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, um, and so that they wouldn't be destroyed along with the other wise men of Babylon. Okay, So God, in response to that, uh, they're requesting compassion, from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, what does he do? He responds, and he reveals this mystery um, and delivers them from death. And, you know, it's just, it hit me, you know, when we start talking about prayer, I think we're just going to pause for a second, and God knows what he's going to do, doesn't he? In every moment of every day he's accomplishing his purposes. So when we kneel and pray, what's going on for us? What's going on for us? Why is that so critical for us to pour out our hearts to him, this absolutely sovereign God, as opposed to, well, it's going to happen, why pray? Why do this like Daniel did? I think it's important to keep the uh, communication with God going. Okay, it's our, we're, we're communicating with him, right? We're, we're involved with him. We know who he is. So what's that, what's happening in our hearts as we do that? What, what's going on then when we pour our hearts out to him, There you go. There's a, there's a true, when you're on your knees, it's, it, it has to be humbling. You're, you're, you're interacting with the one who holds every heartbeat in his hand. We know he's sovereign, and yet he bids us to come and pour our hearts out to him, right? For our benefit in terms of this relationship with him that is our very life, Okay. Now, in the, in the case of Daniel and his friends, what are they pouring their heart out to him about? What's going on? What's on the table with regard to this prayer that they're beseeching him and talking to him about? Okay, okay. And so, does Daniel know that God has given this dream to the king? Sure. Sure, this is a different kind of dream. He, he talked to Arioch, remember, and Arioch explained what's going on, that he had this dream that, that he couldn't, it was like any other dream. Daniel understands that this is God at work to accomplish his purposes and promote his purposes in giving the king this dream. So what are they petitioning God for? We want to... It's really for the furtherance of God's plan and purpose, and to set his name on display, they're asking for an understanding, okay? This isn't a self-centered prayer. It's a prayer that's about God being honored, him using them, yes. He's placed them in the court of the king with great integrity and prestige, and so they're there for a purpose, for his purpose to be furthered. And so they're asking for God to give them an understanding to further his plan and purpose. They believe they're there for a reason. They do not believe it's time for them to be murdered by the king. They're there to promote God's glory. So they're asking to that end. Okay? 
And I think that, <clears throat> dear people, when we, start, when we start talking about what we pray for, the things we pray for, not, there's nothing off limits. Let's push, put it that way. When we come, when you read the psalmist prayers, they, they, they just pour their heart out to God. Everything from their attitudes to circumstances, they are wanting to, uh, they pour their hearts out. But as you look at some of Paul's prayers, uh, we can see what is critical, in a sense. And, and the prayers of the Apostle Paul and others in the New Testament ha have to do with the glory and majesty of God and in setting him on display as we live out our lives in this wonderful, saving, gracious work of God, as things are moving forward to a climax and culmination Let's just, 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 for, just wanted to read a few of Paul's prayers to us because everything's on the table, but there are things we need to be earnestly pr praying to God to do in our midst, in our lives for his glory. So, in Ephesians 1, 15, he says, For this reason, I too having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, supernatural grace is being poured out. Do not, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. Purpose, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. To know him is eternal life. To know him, Paul's praying for that. They would have this knowledge, not just in their brains, experiential understanding of who he is as they're living under his hand. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. See, see, the gospel's about power. The gospel's about you being transformed by the Spirit of God for the glory of God. And so to set you off from the rest of the world, to show the world God himself. This is what Paul's praying about, furthering the purposes of God. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. That's what Paul's praying. Man, I, I hope that's what we're praying. As we pray for one another <laughs> in this battle against an enemy, uh, persevere in it, Ephesians 6, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, and pray on my behalf that the utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Man, are we praying that for one another in the midst of this dark land to be able to have the courage to open our mouths when we need to, to bear witness to the God we love and serve and the beauty of an infinitely beautiful Savior who alone can deliver from sin, death, and the law. For love, Philippians 1, 9, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. It's not just emotionalism. It's, it's love that's anchored in real knowledge of God and discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, the coming of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You see, the one who practices righteousness is righteous. We, are we praying for that in this relationship we have with God, for one another to manifest the reality of that transforming power at work? I think sometimes when we view the, the Christianity and the Christian life, sometimes there's been such a focus of, you know, 
we, we are still sinners for sure. But we are sinners being transformed by the power and grace of God. And, and there's an attitude in the church, you know, you know how, how, how much can I sin and live and still get to heaven? You know, well, well, that's not the purpose. That's not what God's doing in his children. He's bringing them into a genuine, true knowledge of who he is. That's eternal life. That's eternal life. It's not just having a sense in your mind, I'm not going to hell because my sins are taken care of. Do you know God? Do you love him? Colossians 1, one more. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Same things. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Once again, it's not just head knowledge, it's relationship, genuine, intimate relationship being lived out, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. <clears throat> Folks, prayer is for our benefit. But we also need to see that these men were praying not for themselves, but for the furtherance of the plan and purpose and glory of God in the midst of this dire, life-threatening circumstance. So may God help us to not just pour our hearts out for our needs. We, we're very needy people, but the kinds of things Paul prayed need to be prayed by us for one another. Please pray these things for me. I'll pray these things for you to know him more intimately and deeply uh, and enjoy the God you're getting to know. Okay. <clears throat> The revelation of the dream, then, to Daniel uh, will, re will result in some things. I wrote them down here. Uh, will result in God's name being exalted in the pagan court and kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. That's number one. Number two, it does prevent the death of his servants. Right? And number three, it draws, I think... It draws these men who know him nearer to him in their walk of love, faith, and obedience, knowing, get this, knowing and experiencing the truth that he is the one in complete control of all things, no matter how life-threatening the circumstances. Isn't that true? Boy, we have people in this church who are, have terminal illnesses. And just to have, to, to know that this is, that the purpose is to draw you in the circumstances of life, the trials and the troubles, to draw you nearer to his heart, this one who does love you with infinite love uh, is significant. So what is God doing in, for them then in the midst of it? He's using them. But their God is building their faith and trust in him and drawing them nearer to his heart as they must live for his glory in the darkness of a God-hating, God-rejecting society. So here's an implication for us. Uh, what is true for them is true for us. This is as true for you and me today as it was for Daniel in Babylon. We live in a God-hating society. God-rejecting society, don't we? In which we are also called to be salt and light in the midst of it, just like Daniel was being. Jesus told us that men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. Jesus was hated because he was the light exposing the darkness of the sin in the individuals and society around him. We will be hated because our very lives and priorities expose the darkness around us. I don't know if you've sensed that, but just your life, 
just your attitudes, just your perspective condemns those around us in this society. And it's going to become more and more that way. And as we live for Jesus in our culture, what's, what's going to happen? God will show us his mighty power as he keeps us. And, and people, that doesn't mean you're going to be delivered from the trials, but he's going to keep you in the midst of it, even if it's unto death. He's going to keep you. He keeps us, encourages us, loves us, transforms us, increasing our faith, love, joy, and peace in him when the trials and troubles sometimes just seem overwhelming to us, drawing us, what, nearer to his own heart and setting his name and honor on display through us. See, that's the key of everything, isn't it? Our privilege is to be used up by him to honor his name. Folks, you exist for his purposes. He doesn't exist for you to make you happy. It's just not the way it is. But I will tell you this, as he uses you up, even at times ordaining that you give your life up for him like he did the church at Smyrna, many of those dear saints, you know what the benefit will be? You get him. You get him forever. Forever you get the Lord God, right? Um, he's your inheritance. He's your portion. He's your joy. He's your future. Uh, we get him. So it's about setting him on display with everything that we have in the midst of this dark society. Does that make sense? It's going to cost you to do that, but the reward is infinitely beautiful and wonderful. You get him. You get him. Okay, Daniel blesses the God of heaven, page 2. <clears throat> then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. Uh, he calls him the, this, with this significant phrase, the God of heaven. We mentioned this last time. This description in the midst of a pagan culture of Babylon sets the true creator God above all the demonic occult practices where the magicians, conjurers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans used the created universe, stars, and heavens to predict the future and the will of the gods. The uncreated creator of heaven alone can declare this mystery to Daniel. See, there's, God is setting up this magnificent contrast between who he is and what's going on in this pagan society. Because that's what God's about, the glory of his own name. The revelation, of course, brings praise from Daniel's lips. Daniel blessed the God of heaven. The Aramaic for blessed is barik and, and means to speak words of excellence about someone. Words of excellence. To praise him or to bless him. And he, it, it, be praised forever and ever. Uh, and then he gives the reason why. For wisdom and power belong to him. It's, it's wonderful that these two attributes are crucial, crucial to God accomplishing his purposes, to God accomplishing his purposes, uh, his divine plan and purpose as he moves in history, the history of the nations and individuals to establish the glorious, consummated, eternal kingdom of the Son of Man, the Messiah, on earth for the glory of his name. You see, not only does God have the infinite wisdom to devise the plan, the one single plan that will bring him the most glory, he has the wisdom to do that, but he has the omnipotent power to bring it about. Praise God for that. It's the best plan, and he has the power to bring it about. You know, here's an, another implication for us. I mean, we, we, we understand, I think, many of us, the sovereignty of God. Uh, but uh, at least for me, it's easy 
while experiencing the, the weighty difficulties of life, and they don't even have to be that weighty for me. Sometimes they're just little frustrations. You know, to momentarily, momentarily, I'll say that because it's a fight of faith, momentarily forget that all, all that is occurring is in accordance with the infinite wisdom of our loving God and being brought about by his omnipotent power. Not one moment is passing where that's not true. Not one moment in your life. He is working all things together for our good. If we love him, only those who love him, that's true for conforming us into the image of his dear son. And the great purpose of that is found in Romans 8, 29. Why is he conforming you to that image? Why glorification one day? Here's why. So that one glorious consummated day, Jesus will be the firstborn, the preeminent one among many brethren. Conformity to the image of Christ is not about you, and that's where it stops. It's so you, one day, can worship, adore, exalt, praise, honor, love, fear, serve him without sin to the eternal glory of God the Father. That's what it's about. Like Daniel, may the Lord help us to live in this constant hope of the certain fulfillment of the magnificent promises he has made to us when the Son of Man comes to establish his glorious kingdom. Folks, throughout the New Testament, it just says we're living in the light of his soon coming. In fact, we're longing expectantly for it. We're loving his appearing. That had better be true for you because that's where it's going. That's where it's going, right, folks? Okay. We love his appearing. We live for it. We're eagerly waiting for it. In the midst of the darkest times, we know that's a certainty. And he could come today for his church. Today. For his church. So Daniel extols the character of God in 21 and 22. <coughs> It's he who changes the times and epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. Daniel now declares what God does in the exercise of his wisdom and power. The God of heaven with divine power, changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings as if they're nothing before him. He just, according to his plan. Isn't, this is going to be directly relevant to the king's dream. We, we will see when we talk about his dream. This power of God to bring about the change in nations is critical. He has the power to do it, Right? as the kingdoms unfold in history, as we move toward the appointed consummation. You have a quote there by Tanner at the top of page 3. It talks about the times and the seasons, the epochs, periods of history. I think it's worth, you can read it later. One of the sentences, God determines when in history events are to take place and how long each process or phase in history is to endure. Just like he decreed for for uh, Judah to be in exile for 70 years. Guess what? Daniel later prays, you said it, God, it's going to happen. Sure enough, happens. He determines these things. He determines these things. It's interesting at the bottom, other societies felt that way about their gods. On the famous Cyrus Cylinder, an inscription on a clay cylinder recording the decree of King Cyrus, we find the claim that Marduk disposed Nabonidus and raised up Cyrus as king in his place. Baloney. The reality is, and God's showing that this is what's going on here, people. He's destroying the thoughts of these pagan 
societies. It's only Yahweh and he alone who has the power to do this. Only our God. Who's responsible for administrations in the United States, local government, all the way to the top, international relations? Who's in charge? God. It says in Revelation 1.5 that the Lord Jesus Christ is present tense, the ruler of the kings of the earth, as the resurrected, exalted Messiah under God the Father. It's magnificent. In the exercise of his power and sovereign control over what transpires in his creation, then he alone gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. In the present context of Daniel, this is a profoundly ironic statement, what he says here. The wise men of Babylon, with all their occult practices and books defining their discipline of supernaturally telling the will of the gods concerning the future, have nothing to give to the king, nothing. Nor do they have any way to secure any knowledge or understanding with which to counsel him or calm his anxious mind. Only the true God of heaven can give such wisdom and knowledge to men. And this is what God is doing to make it clear who he is. He set the whole scenario up with the dream in the first place to do this, to set his name on display. That's what God's about. God's wisdom is seen. <clears throat> and dear people, it's not just that God knows everything. Hear this. God's wisdom is seen in his ability to reveal what he alone knows based on the sovereign choices he has made in the wise determining of his purpose and plan being accomplished for his glory. In other words, what he has eternal, eternally decreed, he knows. So he can tell you exactly what's going to happen in the next minute because he has purposed it to happen. There's all kinds of other plans that could have been instituted. He knows all that. But the plan that's going on now, he knows because he ordained it. That's what makes him God. For his glory... He alone can reveal the profound and hidden things, hidden from men, but not from God, who in his wisdom ordained them to occur. He alone knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. Psalm 139, 12, Even the darkness is not dark to you, God, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. There's some other text there for you. 1 John 1, 5, This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. And here's, Isaiah 46 is important. He tells Israel, remember the former things long past. This is how you know the difference between God and the false gods. False gods can't do this. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. That's what makes him God. That's why he can tell the dream and its interpretation, because he's ordained it. All right, Daniel gives thanks and praise to the God of his fathers. This is really important. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we requested of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Now Daniel speaks to God in a very personal way. This true God of heaven, the great creator God of all things, including the stars and the heavens, is addressed by Daniel, to you, O God of my fathers. Daniel addresses God as the great covenant-keeping God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the God in who his hope is, folks. <laughs> the God who makes promises and keeps them. 
He is the personal God of Israel, the God of their deliverance, who revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3 as Yahweh, their God and King. Exodus 3. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you, Yahweh. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. This is who he reveals himself to be. It is to Yahweh that Daniel now voices his praise and thanksgiving. To you, O God of my fathers, I will give thanks and praise. And, and, and again, he then gives the specific reason. God, the one to whom belongs all wisdom and power, is the one who dispenses wisdom and power to men. This is really kind of cool. To accomplish his divine purposes. For you have given me, he says to me, Daniel, wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we have requested of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. Now here's the idea. Because I thought, you know, the idea of Daniel receiving power you can see how this works when you get the meaning of the Aramaic term for power, gibura, and it, it quote, get this, power, possession of controlling influence, often understood as manifesting influence over reality in a supernatural manner. God manifests influence over reality in a supernatural manner, but this idea of Daniel having it now controlling influence, Daniel's prayer, uh, or I'm sorry, by receiving wisdom from God concerning the king's dream, what's going to happen to Daniel? <laughs> wow. He's going to have significant influence from this point on, significant influence in the court of the most powerful king in the ancient Near East at this time. That's power, influence with the king to promote the glory of the true God. Who's doing all this? God's the one who gives power and influence. He's giving it to Daniel to promote his name in this place. Wow. To promote the glory of the true God, Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God of his fathers. I think that's magnificent. You know, folks, God has you where you are for a reason. You know? Who knows the kind of people you'll be interacting with, talking to at work or as life unfolds. But God will place you where you need to be to be like Daniel, a witness and an influence in that place for his name. And we'll see how he witnesses to the king. It's magnificent as we go along. But just remember, he's placed you like Daniel for, for one purpose, to set his name on display. Set his name on display as you live and, 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 and witness for him in wherever he places you. Daniel's prayer extols the greatness of his personal God, the only true God, the God of heaven, the God of his fathers. Wisdom and power belong to him alone. He's the source of all wisdom, accomplishing his purpose and plan among the hosts of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth, as we will see. So now he appears before King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel's appeal to Arioch in 2.24. Therefore, Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had, uh, I'm sorry, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went in and spoke to him as follows. Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me into the king's presence, and I will declare the interpretation to the king. 
Man, you can sense the gravity of Daniel's approach to Arioch. The king had granted time, but Daniel knew that the king was waiting for his report with the death sentence firmly in place to execute to be executed by the man he's now rushing in to see. It's interesting. I think this is interesting. It wasn't my original idea. It came from another. It's interesting to note that the first thing he says to Arioch is, I know the interpretation. No, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon instead of proclaiming that he knows the interpretation. This may be, I think there's something to this, an indication of his concern for them as a group even though he was opposed to their practices, which were in violation of his God's person and truth, Daniel understood that only God could open their blind eyes and change their hard, dark hearts. He knew he was there to be a witness to the true God, to these men and the king. And guess what? Guess who he's already read about? Jonah. He knows about Jonah. It's in their scriptures. Highly likely that Daniel knew the story of Jonah and God's compassion on Nineveh through that man's testimony. So now he's in a pagan land and he's there, he knows, to be a witness to the true God, like Jonah did in a pagan capital. So, like Daniel, this concern for those men as a witness for God, like Daniel... Believers today manifest a radically different perspective and worldview than the unregenerate people around us because they reflect the character of the one who has brought them into a love relationship with himself. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. Love your enemies. (laughs) Love King Nebuchadnezzar's. And pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you're to reflect your Father. You're to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You can look up the story of the Good Samaritan, too. Same idea. Moved with compassion, he takes care of an enemy. An enemy. Believers love much because they've been forgiven much, right? They reflect Christ in the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, showing a dark world that they love Jesus even more than dealing with even, I'm sorry, even when dealing with those who hate them. Isn't that true? It should be true. People, that kind of response to your enemies is supernatural. You can't do that apart from the Spirit of God in you, having a heart like Daniel, understanding who God is and what their need is. You can do that by the grace of God. You you must. It's who a Christian is right? He's presented to the king in 25 and 26. Ariac, get this, hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence, right? And spoke to him as follows, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. The king said, then he get dressed as Daniel. But don't you sense this urgency continuing in the narrative? Ariac hurriedly runs in there, declaring to the king that he had found. I think this is cool because Ariac's going, wow, (laughs) I've got an opportunity to really set myself on display before the king. I've got the guy that can can give him the interpretation, and all these other men haven't been able to do it. And you can sense his relief and sense of self-importance in being able to bring this news to his king. Given the anger that, and the rage that Nebuchadnezzar has been expressing over the inability of his wise men to declare the interpretation of this potentially kingdom-threatening dream, he was now able to bring the king the news that despite the unanimous declaration of all the wise men that there was no human being on earth who could do what the king commanded, he had found one. Good old area. With a king like this, it's good to bring good news. This man was, you don't want to bring bad news to this guy. 
Oh, you, yeah, that's it. You're going to be drawn and quartered, man. Your house is going to be made of rubbish. So the king, what does he do? Immediately puts the critical question to Daniel. Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen in its interpretation? The life of every wise man in the kingdom, as well as Daniel and his friends' lives, depend on this answer. This is interesting, I think. Notice the tech text adds uh, concerning Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar. I think Tanner makes a good observation. Why is this important to add this phrase? Tanner says, uh, uh, Tanner's observation is insightful. Belshazzar is how the king thought of Daniel, okay? Thought of him. Again, this is God's doing. And the name with the prefix Bel associated Daniel with the supreme Babylon deity, Bel, otherwise known as Marduk. The mention of the name Belshazzar is important because it sets the stage for what is about to happen as Daniel honors and glorifies not Bel, Marduk, but the true God of heaven. The king and all other Babylonians may call him by the name Belshazzar, but his real identity is with Yahweh. He's Daniel. God is my judge who was about to manifest his power before the king, the power of the true God. Do you see that? Contrast, contrast. So Daniel exalts the true God before the king. Daniel answered before the king and said, as for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, however, <laughs> There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to the king what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. In, in, in these verses, people, we see Daniel's character and his love for God's glory just shine. So some questions for us as we draw near to our uh, the time of the end here. Um, how does Daniel answer the king? He, he just doesn't come out and go, I'm going to tell you what it means, does he? There's kind of a pause here. Why? What's the first thing he says to the king? Huh? What did you say? Well, and, and, and he says, how does he put it? He says there's, about which, there's, there's neither wise men nor conjurers, nor magicians, nor diviners able to declare it to the king, right? Had the king heard this before? Had he heard this before? Yeah. You, know, you know, back up in 2, what was it, uh, 10, the Chaldeans answered the king and said, there's not a man on earth who could declare the matter for the king, as much as no great king or really has ever asked. You know, it can't be done. Daniel says it can't be done by a man. Tension, pause. So what does he focus on? However, contrast. There's a God in heaven who can do it. Wow. Is God exalting his name? Yes. So the way Daniel even does this, by not declaring it, but by saying that where the king was so upset before, I already know that, Daniel. What, you know. However, and we'll see what he says about himself in a minute. Now, if you had not been, if you didn't know the true God and you went in there and you knew the dream, what's your focus going to be? I'm great, king. I know what's going on. Let me tell you about it. Wouldn't you? About yourself, your own importance, not Daniel. It's about God. And this denouncement of the king's occult advisors contrasted to the exaltation of the only true God of heaven. This contrast was prophesied by Isaiah over a century earlier. Go to page 7. Listen to this. In the condemnation by Isaiah of Babylon, listen to what God says in Isaiah 47. Stand fast now in your spells and in your many sorceries with which you have labored from your youth, Babylon. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you may cause trembling. You are wearied with your many counsels. 
Let now the astrologers, those who prophesy by the stars, those who predict the new moon, stand up and save you from what will come upon you. You're not going to be able to stop my hand when I judge you. And Isaiah 44, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, he's talking to Israel, and the one who formed you from the womb, I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out all the earth all alone, causing the omens of boasters to fail, making fools out of diviners, causing wise men to draw back and turning their knowledge into foolishness. This is God. And he's doing it in, the, in front of the king of Babylon. Now, that term, the latter days, is, is significant. I'm going to let you read that. It has to do, when it uses that phrase, it's more way to the end, all the way to the end and the coming of Messiah to establish the kingdom. Okay? And he gives you some text there. Uh, and we'll see that sets in, is set in contrast to the next verses. But anyway... To that next bullet point, Daniel, Daniel, this is key, promoted the character and glory of his God, not himself, and we have been called to do the same thing, haven't we? This life is not about you, it's about your great God. 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession. Here's the purpose of him bringing you to himself so that you may proclaim, not your own excellencies, the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Your purpose is the same purpose as God the Father, to set Jesus Christ on display with every breath you have to the glory of God. That's your purpose. I think that's wonderful to be having the same purpose as God the Father. So Dan, Daniel hum, humbly sums up the king's dream. Listen to this. As for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future. And he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. But as for me, this, look at, listen to this. But as for me, I mean, I'm, part of, I'm part of one of that other group I told you about. This mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than in any other living man. No living man could declare this to you. But for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. Um, latter days, as opposed to latter days, which is all the way to the end, he uses the phrase in the future. And, and that's more of a term, general term that picks up history, even including the present with Nebuchadnezzar and moving forward. It's kind of like the scope of it, okay? The broad, the broad sketch of history from Nebuchadnezzar's time, we're on page eight now, until the inauguration of the Messianic age. This fits with the dream. This fits with the dream. I think this is another important point here. Um, notice he describes God in this verse not as the God of heaven here, but as he who reveals mysteries. It's possible that he does not mention him again as the God of heaven to focus the king's attention on the key difference between him and the many impotent gods of Babylon who were unable, unable to disclose to the king through his wise men and all their sorcery and occult practices the truth concerning the future. Nebuchadnezzar needed to reflect on the stark contrast between he who reveals mysteries, the one who has made known to you what will take place, and the powerless Babylonian deities. This is, think about this now. Daniel, Daniel continues to highlight the wisdom and power of his God by humbly declaring who reveals mysteries. Not him, but his God. And uh, I think what happens here is that Daniel now, Daniel is now, because he says, God has made this known to you so that you can understand it in your mind. Remember, he was so agitated. He was just going nuts with God's revealing it to you so you can understand it. 
In doing that, in saying that, Daniel now brings King Nebuchadnezzar into direct contact, in a sense, with the God of heaven who reveals mysteries. Earlier, he'd said, I had a dream. My spirit is anxious to understand the dream, and God, through Daniel, is going to make the interpretation known to the king, easing his anxiousness by giving him the understanding he desires. Um, I think that's amazing. But it is, it is bringing Nebuchadnezzar into direct contact with this God, isn't it? That's grace, man. That's grace. Right, right. And, and here, here Daniel says, this God who you don't acknowledge at all. Yeah. Just, just give me wisdom to interpret the dream to you. He's the one who gave you the dream. Yeah. Predicting what's yeah. going to happen. This God that you think your gods are superior yeah. to because you defeated Judah is God. Yeah. I think that's the whole point, brother. In, in this whole scenario, God's doing this to exalt his name. Set himself on display. I had an implication here just at the end for us. As you look at Daniel and how he deals with this in front of the most powerful man in his day, he doesn't make it about him. Why? Because he, he knows the true God. He's humble. He's humble. You told me that earlier. If you know God, you have to be humble. So the point for us is, by the grace of God and the power of the Spirit, believers are humble people. They are. The first beatitude Jesus described a citizen of the kingdom of heaven with was, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit means being humble, someone who is not spiritually arrogant or proud. It's the opposite of the self-righteous religious leaders who are set in contrast in that sermon to a true child of God or a citizen of the kingdom. There's a contrast in that sermon because of the genuine reality of change in the hearts of God's people. They're humble people. Isaiah 66, 2, For my hand made all these things, thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord, but to this one I will look, look to him who is humble and contrite of spirit. And get this, what goes along with humility? You tremble at his word because of the one who spoke it you tremble you fear him not men peter says younger men likewise be subject to your elders and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another for god is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble that's why it's what characterizes his children and then philippians 2 you know that have this attitude in yourselves which is also in christ jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We're to be like him. We're to be like him. Folks, a proud lifestyle and a genuine relationship with the living God cannot coexist. How would the people closest to you describe you? Humble person or proud, puffed up, arrogant? May our lives humbly reflect a selfless desire to set our Savior on display, not ourselves, right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. What a privilege to behold your glory and majesty and beauty in all that you do. And especially in this time with Daniel in Babylon, we see his heart for you. We see you superintend over all things. You're, you're his sovereign God who's protecting and watching over and using him. You're, just, you're our God. Help us to be like him in the midst of this fallen, dark society and trust you for the results as we stand for you out of love for you and honor your name with our obedience to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.